Hello and welcome to the Topic 8 run through. So let's get into it. Um, so first of all, mutation. So I've just put a few prompts in these boxes that I'll, that I'll go through. Um, so it's just been aware that, yeah, mutation occurs twice in the syllabus. It occurs in Topic 4 and in Topic um, 8 as well. And um, you can think of them in terms of small scale mutations where we're basically changing the code of a gene. So, you know, small scale examples, you know, think deletion, addition, which kind of do the same thing. And the third one is substitution. However, for each of these, if I, if I just did one of them, you know, one nucleotide deletion or one base substitution, um, it needs to occur within an exon of a gene. It has no effect if it occurs in an intron. It has no effect if it doesn't occur within a gene. They have to occur within an exon of a gene um, that is expressed. Um, and I always think of these, if I write an answer, I always think of SSS, which is sequence, sequence, shape. So when we do a substitution mutation, I change the sequence of bases in the gene. So I can talk about the sequence of bases in the gene, exon of a gene. So gene base sequence. Um, I can also, if I wanted another mark, I could talk about therefore there's a change in sequence of the mRNA codons. Then I can talk about there's a change of sequence of amino acids. Um, and I could even add about tRNA anticodon codon pairing, that tRNAs carry a specific amino acid. And if I change the mRNA codons, a different tRNA will bring a different amino acid. Um, and then instead of shape, I'm going to talk about tertiary structure. And those two, that's where I talk about like R group bonding. A different amino acid will have a different R group that may bond in a different way with an adjacent amino acid, and therefore you get a different tertiary structure. And they often about ask about enzymes, in which case I talk about the active site eventually as well. So let's look at the next little bit. Um, so yeah, frame shift is um, in the syllabus and it relates to mRNA only. Well, the word frame shift is related to the ribosome moving. The, the ribosome binds to the start codon of the mRNA and it moves a codon at a time. So if we've done a deletion or an addition, um, then it, when it still reads it in threes. Okay, so it's how the ribosome moves. So the frame shift is due to the, um, yeah, yeah, the, the ribosome moves. Oop, pen's not working. Ribosome moves one cord on along the mRNA. Um, yeah, so you can get a frame shift, if you, if you did a, a base deletion, then it's going to cause a frame shift. Um, how can deletions not cause a frame shift? Well, if there were three consecutive ones, you would in effect just remove a codon from the actual mRNA. I should have said at the start, actually, a mutation, let's just define it. This is a change in sequence of bases in the DNA, or a change in amount of DNA, change in the amount of DNA. And that's why I broke it down to the small scale mutations because they would do the first bit. There'd be a change of sequence of bases in the DNA. Um, and then it goes into how does a non-disjunction mutation cause trisomy in a zygote so remember, non-disjunction, this is this error during meiosis. So this is an error during meiosis. Um, and I always think of it of, in the fact that I've got a cell here. I've got, there's a, um, a chromosome. This is in meiosis too. And then there's another little chromosome here as well. Um, and then my centromeres are here and there, 
um, and I'm going to attach to the centromeres. Centrioles are there, and they attach to the centromeres. I did the classic error. Um, however, that one's not going to reach. Um, this one is going to reach. Yeah, so we end up with a failure of the spindle to attach to one of the chromosomes. And therefore, if we play this out, we're going to end up with um, two cells being made, one on the top and one on, on the bottom. Um, the bottom one, well, well, let's do the top one. So um, that's going to contain that chromosome and the red one's going to be in the bottom cell. So that has worked normally because the spindle is going to retract that way and that way. Retract, not contract. It's not a muscle. Um, however, the blue one is going to end up being pulled downwards and not separate the chromatids. And therefore, it will separate later on. You know, just um, when it unravels, but I've got two copies of that chromosome and none in the other. So if this becomes a sperm cell and it fertilizes plus um, an egg cell, and the egg cell is going to be normal. So it's got one red and one blue. That means that the zygote that we produce over here, so the, um, the fertilized cell is going to have you know, two copies of the red, like it should do, one from each parent, and it's going to have three copies of the blue. And therefore, that's trisomy. And if that's chromosome 21, then, then that leads to Down syndrome. So this is a large scale mutation because we are swapping an entire kind of, you know, we are moving an entire chromosome. Other large scale ones include a translocation. You've seen that word in, in terms of the phloem. Um, it just means other location. Um, and then there's a duplication. And these are both errors in meiosis. Errors, and it's basically during crossing over. So translocation is when you get crossing over between non-homologous chromosomes. Um, and duplication, this is a, it's a, it's homologous chromosomes, but it's a, it's a uneven loci. So it's, this is different loci different loci. So you end up having two copies of one gene and missing genes in the other. There is an inversion mutation as well, which really is a large scale mutation, but um, I've seen the ask where they, where they basically just inverted a section of the code within a gene. So it's just responding to any detail that they give you about that. So that's mutation. Remember, mutations are not good, bad. They you know, they can be good, they can be bad. Um, it depends. So, you know, when when they are bad, you know, that's when I'll be talking about recessive allele diseases and things. Um, and when they're good, um, then, well, that's like natural selection. If there's a mutation that leads to a beneficial adaptation, then that's going to be passed on as well. So I just don't think that they're always, always bad. Um, so that's mutation. Let's go on to estrogen next. Again, topic eight is full of lots of little bits of things. Um, so let's make sense of this. It says, use a diagram to describe how estrogen will cause specific genes that control the cell cycle to be transcribed. Refer to all labeled parts in the diagram. So here's our cell membrane. So we, we are within a cell because there's the nuclear envelope. Um, and here's some DNA and it's wrapped around a histone. Um, that should be histones, really. Let me just change that to an S. Histones. It could be pointing to one. There's like a cluster of them. And then we've got this complex where we've got um, an estrogen receptor um, that was bonded onto the inhibitor a second ago, but estrogen has entered the entered the cell. Um, and it's bonded to the receptor because their shapes are complementary. Don't call it an active site, it's a receptor, but it's still a protein. So this is a protein. The inhibitor is a protein. The transcription factor is a protein as well. So once estrogen binds, um, it means that the receptor has changed shape and it's released from the inhibitor. So let's make, make a note of that first. So I saw step one. Um, well, in fact, let's go back a bit. Estrogen um, diffuses into cell. 
into cell um, by the phospholipid bilayer. Doesn't need a receptor to get into the cell, it's lipid soluble. And it binds to a receptor, so it binds to a complementary receptor. Again, I'm doing it in no form, you can write complementary fully after. Um, the, the receptor changes to shape, receptor, I suppose, um, changes shape and is released from inhibitor protein. Uh, so that's a really good, you know, any kind of shape change essay. Um, it's kind of similar to how a non-competitive inhibitor works. It binds to the enzyme away from the active site and it causes a shape change. It's the same kind of thing. It's disrupting R group bonding is estrogen um, as it binds to the receptor. Um, so estrogen is its job now, so is the receptor. So, so now I'm just going to focus on the transcription factor. I know it's all connected, uh, but different diagrams show this coming off. Um, it's just an interpretation of it. So next thing is the transcription factor, which I'm just going to call TF. Um, so TF diffuses into um, nucleus via a nuclear pore. So that's going to diffuse into here. Uh, these estrogen receptors, by the way, can be in the nucleus. Our syllabus says that they're in the cytoplasm. However, they can be in the nucleus. And it makes sense for them to be in the, in the nucleus because then they're closer to the DNA that they have to interact with. Um, so yeah, TF, the transcription factor, that, that's going to compete with the specific histones. Um, so it competes for a specific part of the DNA. and removes histones at that location. So it's going to basically going to boot out. Those histones are going to be removed when the transcription factor, which is shared in red, um, that's going to bind to here. And that can, that's going to push out the histones temporarily. And it's bonded to a specific part. So then RNA polymerase, can now bind to specific gene promoters. Um, and therefore activate, activate genes that cause cell division. So you know it, it could be as simple as it call it's it's I'm turning on the DNA polymerase gene and therefore the DNA can be copied before the cell can divide. Again, it could be anything. Um, again, they would tell you about it in an in an A level question. Hence why a lot of the questions are going to be suggest an explanation for. They're going to tell you how the, this works. This is my interpretation of it. However, it's not necessarily how it does function. Um, because we are all, um, yeah, making this A level rather than degree level, and therefore we're all abbreviating little steps of it. Um, so yeah, so just, just be aware that this isn't, you know, the actual mechanism. This is an abbreviation of the actual mechanism. Um, again, I've seen questions where the transcription factor basically. Um, acts as a stimulus uh, um, for um, RNA polymerase, so the histones aren't involved. But I thought it's quite nice to have an example with a histone involved, because yeah, when the DNA is wrapped around a histone, RNA polymerase can't get to the genes, and therefore those genes are effectively turned off. Um, but if we remove the histone, then the genes can be expressed. Um, this will have a certain half-life as well, again, this transcription factor. 
So when when that's lost, it just respools up again and that gene gets turned off. So that's estrogen, again, it's a really good example of you know, movement in the cells or how information is passed from one place to another. Um, oh, and just cr crucially, um, we need to be aware of how this links to cancer. Um, well, if you had more of these complexes, then that would make you more likely um, to um, for, for this scenario to happen. So, um, and you know, if there was a mutation to an inhibitor that meant that this was never inhibited, then also that would be as well. So it's just relating to it. So if the transcription factor gets to the nucleus, it's gonna cause cell division. So anything that causes that transcription factor to get there more often, is gonna to link to faster cell division. That's a tumor. And then we'll, but we'll get onto that later. Um, in fact, let's do tumor and cancer now. Um, so these get confused, do um, the word tumor and cancer. People use them interchangeably. So tumor is just, um, it's a mass of cells due to faster cell division. And these faster cell division. And there's two types of tumour, they can be benign or malignant. So it says describe three ways in which benign tumours become malignant. Well, benign tumours are in a um, capsule. So, um, so the cells yeah, move out of the capsule. That's that's one step. I'm trying to think of the other one. Um, so, in 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 a benign tumor, they are encapsulated and they do not spread, or they don't invade other other tissue. So it's kind of it's kind of similar as this, but yeah. So the uh, so the cells invade um, surrounding tissue. That in itself isn't that bad. If this was a skin tumour, you know, I, I, I would just be losing a bit of skin. It wouldn't matter. However, the main thing about malignant is that they spread, um, not just invading surrounding tissue, but they spread so that they can dislodge from each other and, and get into the bloodstream. So, um, so the cells... Um, yeah, become mobile. Not stuck, yeah, yeah, not stuck together, therefore spread. And this, the posture of that is metastasize or metastasize um, to other parts of the body. Um, and a malignant tumour, yeah, that causes the disease, cancer. So cancer is the disease due to a malignant tumour. Right, next, explain why the gene that causes for the estrogen receptor is also classed as a proto-oncogene. Um, refer to the diagram in the estrogen section. So a proto-oncogene is a class of, this is just a class of, a class of genes that are um, linked to normal cell division. So the estrogen, when estrogen binds to the receptor, in effect, an event is going to occur that's going to cause the cell to divide. Um, so because of that, it's classed as a proto-oncogene. If it goes wrong, then it um, can become an oncogene. So if we look at this, so remember, before this happened, the receptor was bonded to the inhibitor. Um, and when estrogen bonded, it changed the shape of the receptor. Well, maybe the receptor has the wrong shape to start with. That's not, that means it doesn't bind to the inhibitor. 
and it doesn't need estrogen to bind to it to change shape. So in effect, it would always be going to the nucleus to cause cell division, irrespective of the inhibitor or estrogen. So that's... Um, Yeah, so this is where I say that yeah, if it mutated, if the estrogen receptor gene mutated, it might call for a receptor that has a different shape different tertiary structure, therefore could cause faster cell division, I would now be an oncogene. So a proto-oncogene is a gene linked to normal cell division that if it mutates it can cause faster cell division and that's an oncogene. So I always think of oncogenes as um, like a metronome beating out a rhythm. So in a normal like breast cell, when estrogen arrives, that causes the cells to divide. So the cells divide at the right pace to keep up with cell death. However, um, if one of the genes calls for like more of the more of the estrogen receptor, or a mal a mal shaped form of it then that can cause faster cell division like putting on a faster beat. Uh, explain why one mutated tumor source gene does not lead to a tumor. Yeah so we have genes are in pairs. Yeah so there's two copies of each tumor suppressor gene therefore there's still one functional copy still one functional copy Therefore, um, cell division speed is controlled. Yeah, so like light brakes on a bike are tumor suppressor genes. Ideally, you have two that work, but you can cope with one. Um, and people, you know, um, if you've got an inherited likelihood of developing tumor, then you've probably inherited a one mutated tumor suppressor gene. And then you just need to inherit another, sorry, gain another one due to mutation. And then that's going to lead to tumour. Again, I can, the, these are classes of genes. There isn't one tumour specific gene. There, there are many of them. So that's, we're 20 minutes in. So let's get on to in vivo gene cloning next. Um, this is the same as... Um, you know, this is you know re recombinant DNA technology. Or it's genetic engineering. This is putting genes into a living thing. Learn your enzymes and learn what they do. So there's name the enzyme that cuts the DNA and one that joins DNA. So the one that cuts, this is our um, restriction endonucleases, restriction endonuclease, the one that joins DNA, this is DNA ligase. They both cut and form the same bond, so they both deal with phosphodester bonds. Um, what is a sticky end and why do they form? Well, some restriction enzymes, um, which I'm going to call RE, um, yeah, so some REs bind to a palindromic sequence, DNA sequence, and um, perform a staggered cut. So in effect, we, we get that shape. 
in terms of our DNA fragment. Yeah, they cut like yeah, so they've they've cut to leave that that overhang. Uh, and what is the aim of in vivo gene cloning? Well, generally, you know, I don't want to get copies of the gene. Yeah, occasionally you, you might do for um, if you're trying to um, amplify things within, within bacteria like plasmids, but normally it's to make the cells make a protein. So it's generally to yeah, put a new gene into cells to gain a specific protein. And then the diagram below shows colonies of recombinant bacteria. So that's those that have got a new gene growing in a Petri dish. Explain why the new gene had to be inserted within the blue, within the blue protein gene. So this is where we've got a, they've been inserted with a plasmid. So let's just go around the diagram first. So here's our Petri dish. These dots are colonies of bacteria that have grown. I've got bacteria that do not make a blue protein and bacteria that make a blue protein and the egg are containing antibiotic tetracycline. So that means that my plasmid that we used, so the, the, the bioplasmid, and there's two marker genes within this plasmid. Um, this one here, um, let's just do it in, in blue. This is our um, tetracycline resistance. This one here, this is our blue dye, blue dye protein gene, antibody resistance gene. So I'm, I'm going to pop this plasmid into bacteria. So it's like, where do I insert the new gene? Well, the insertion site is going to be within this blue protein gene. This is our insert site. So a bacterium with this plasmid will be resistant to tetracycline, therefore it'll grow. A bacterium without this plasmid will die. So this Petri dish will be littered with dead bacteria. So all these green dots are bacteria that haven't grown. They're all dead. They've been killed by a tetracycline because they didn't take up a plasmid that had the tetracycline resistance gene. Um, and then if I the ones that I want are going to be these here that do not make the blue protein. Because if I, if I insert a gene within the blue dye protein gene, then um, it can't make the blue protein. Um, so, yeah, so those are the ones that I want. So the black ones are just in, in my diagram here, or those that would be blue. They're just, you know, when I cut open the plasmids, the plasmid just reformed again. It didn't insert a new gene, um, and that's quite likely to happen. So next is cDNA, uh, refer to how it's made and why it's used. So this is where I'm going to put a, this is for eukaryotic genes into prokaryotes. Uh, prokaryotes can't cope with introns, um, so I can't just cut a gene out of a eukaryote and pop it into a prokaryote. So it's a layer GCSE saying we, we cut out the human insulin gene and we pop it into a prokaryote and then it, the prokaryotes make insulin. That wouldn't work. So we use cDNA um, and that's when we, we, make, we take mRNA from a pancreas cell. Yeah, mRNA for insulin. So a cell making insulin will have lots of mRNA. We add our um, enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And then we, we make complementary or a cDNA. And that has got no introns. It's exons only. So it directly codes for the protein. Um, so again, this is like a, a fast way of getting hold of the DNA that you want. It might even be that 
you know, there's a plant with this brilliant characteristic. And therefore, instead of like searching through its entire genome for it, well, a cell that's making the protein that's amazing, I can just go to that cell. That cell is going to have mRNA if it's making that protein. And then I can just extract the mRNA and reverse transcriptase and make cDNA with no introns. Um, um, however, it still can't be read by machinery in a cell. So yeah, what two segments need to be attached to it so it can be transcribed correctly? Well, it needs a start called a promoter region. Got a start code on promoter region. That's where RNA polymerase binds. The enzyme that, that does transcription. And we need a terminator, not a stop code on. That's we're dealing with, with DNA here. Terminator sequence or region doesn't really matter um, and this and that's the end of the gene so RNA polymerase knows to stop transcribing so yeah they need to be ligated on using DNA ligase as well 30 minutes we're doing well we're like halfway through a topic though so next so that was in vivo gene cloning this is in vitro gene cloning. So PCR is the same as in vitro gene cloning. I've underlined it so because it should be in italics. It says refer to temperatures 53 degrees C, 7395. Write out a method for how the DNA is copied, refer or label the diagram. Um, so let's start here. Um, so there's some double stranded DNA. It's now single stranded. So yeah, so and we do that with um, 95 degrees C. Um, then we have to cool it to 53 degrees C, so that that step can happen. And then we need to raise it up to 73 degrees C. Um, these temperatures don't need to be exact, but yeah, you you do need to know roughly that there's a you know, um, a cold well. A, a 50 odd, a 70 odd and a 90 odd. So let's go through the um, what happens at each temperature. So at 95 degrees C, this is where H bonds break between DNA. H bonds um, break, not hydrolyzed. This is just doing it with, with temperature. There's no enzymes involved. There's no water involved. Hydrogen bonds break to separate the strands. The DNA strands. So this is in a machine that heats up and cools down quickly called a thermal cycler. So then, then it cools down to 53 degrees C. This is where the primers um, hybridize or anneal. As in they, they form hydrogen bonds. Um, and there, yeah, to bracket the sequence. To be copied. So I'm not going to copy the entire DNA. It's just a small section of the DNA. Um, and it also gives a starting point. Point. Allowing DNA polymerase to bind. That's the same as TAC polymerase. It's just TAC polymerase is heat stable DNA polymerase. And then 73 degrees C. This provides the activation energy. For DNA polymerase to um, form phosphodiester bonds. And therefore copy the DNA. And then it just, just cycles it and then it's yeah the then the cycle is repeated. Oop, spell repeat it is repeated. So yeah, every every cycle of temperatures I double the amount of DNA. So if I started with one segment of DNA after thirty cycles, that's gonna be I started with one piece of DNA and it's therefore and I'm, and I'm doubling it each time. And it was 30 cycles. So whatever that comes to, it's yeah, two to the power of 30 will be the number of copies of DNA that I get. 
that's PCR in vitro gene clones. If you if you just want to copy the DNA, use PCR. Yeah. However, because of the high temperatures, um, it is quite error prone. So you wouldn't do this if you were trying to make an accurate copy of a piece of DNA. Um, next is electrophoresis. Again, it's a technique. Um, so yeah, so we have a, an, an agarose gel, or a gel. Um, I explain why DNA fragments move in the agarose gel. Yeah, so DNA has what charge? Yeah, is negatively charged. Negatively charged. It's got that phosphate ion, PO43 minus, um, and um, it moves towards towards a positive electrode. So yeah, it goes in the gel. You put a positive electrode on the on the opposite end to where the DNA goes in 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 the well. And therefore, it will just be pulled towards it. Um, the key thing here is that, yes, yeah, small fragments move faster. Small frag move faster. Um, explain why a blue dye is required. Well, we can't see the DNA. Um, the um, yeah, dye is a very small negative charge molecule therefore I can visualize when good separation is present when good separation of DNA has occurred so think of the of the DNA as, as a, as a dye it's going ahead of the DNA so it's smaller than the smallest fragment of DNA so it's small, so it moves faster. So it's moving ahead of the smallest fragment. So when it gets to the end of the gel, you can turn off the current and otherwise it stops the DNA being pulled out into the buffer solution. Um, and then yeah, and in the process of removing DNA fragments from the gel, this is just Southern blotting. So if you want to work with the DNA, um, it's fragile in the gel. If it warms up, the gel will go sloppy. You'll lose position. So this is a way of taking the DNA out of the gel and it moves it onto a nylon filter. Um, and, and then it's baked. So it fixes the DNA in those positions that it was in when it was in the gel. And then you've got like a permanent record of it. Um, oh, and... Um, yeah, we're going to get to electrophoresis in a minute because all this stuff here, um, I should have gone across the top before though because I'm going back to stuff from previous. But let's do it anyway. Um, epigenetics next. Explain why epigenetic changes to DNA are not a type of mutation. Well, a, mu a mutation is a change of sequence of the DNA or a change in the amount of DNA. Yes, yeah, so there's, there is no change to DNA sequence. Or amount of DNA in a cell. So remember, epigenetics are yeah, herit or they can be heritable changes to um, gene expression without a change to sequence. Right, next is acetylation and methylation. So methylation, I, I think if there's, yeah, so more methylation of, um, oh, is it histones or DNA? It is technically both, but yeah, I think it's the, um, it's the DNA. So methylation of the DNA um causes that dna to wrap around histones therefore those genes are turned off
or epimeres can't get to them. Um, acetylation is our um, yes, our histones um, release DNA. Therefore, genes are turned on. Well, I think methylation, so acetylation of histones make them like slippery, and the, and the DNA falls off. Is how I imagine it. And then explain why methylation of a section of DNA may cause a tumour. So it's like, well, what gene do I might I turn off that's going to cause a tumour? So yeah, so if that section of DNA, oh, I'm in blue because I'm on I'm on B, I'm not the one on there. Um, if it's a if it contains a tumour suppressor gene, therefore um, cell division. May speed up. Yeah, assuming no other functional, oops, no other functional tumor specific gene. Um, therefore, you get a mass of cells. She was a tumor. So, you know, acetylation of a histone might cause a oncogene, a proto-oncogene, to be turned on too much, and therefore it's classed as, a, as an oncogene. Um, or, yeah, it's turning off a tumour suppressor gene. Oh, almost there. We're going to get to the hour, probably. Right, genome and proteome next. Define the genome of a typical eukaryotic animal cell. So the genome, this is it's mainly in the nucleus. So it's the it's the genes found in the nucleus, and these can be um, protein coding genes, and also functional genes. Functional, hang on, functional, um, functional genes. Those that code for RNA and tRNA. Um, there's also genes in mitochondria, genes in mitochondria. Stroke chloroplast if you're a, a cell with chloroplast. So yeah, so there's more to the genome. Oh, it says it says animal cell. Read the question. Come on, let, let me get rid of chloroplast. There are no animal cells that have chloroplasts. Um, yeah, genes in mitochondria. Um, why is the proteome of a multipotent stem cell larger than that of a cardiomyocyte? Right, this is just an excuse to do stem cells. So a cardiomyocyte, this is a cell in the heart that makes cardiac tissue. This is a unipotent. It can only... Um, they can renew um, cardiac muscle. Um, whereas multipotent, these are like lymphocytes. Yeah, there, there are, uh, as, well, as in the cells that make lymphocytes. So these, uh, these are, um, can call for many cells. Um, yeah, so there are many cell types e.g. Yeah, all the lymphocytes. Yeah, so it can produce. Let me put that, can produce, or specialise. Um, so yeah, so this, these have got, um, yeah, so there's more genes, more genes can be expressed. Therefore, more different proteins. Whereas the unipotent, it can only cause that one type of cell. And then explain why the amylase gene extracted from cells of salivary glands, one sequence, cannot be used to gain a computer model of amylase's shape. 
So this is just just coming from about how we relate genome to proteome that we we can you know we know the because there's a universal code. I know what codes code for what amino acids, and we we can model how different amino acids in what sequence will form what what shape. However, it's this problem again about introns. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the gene is made of introns. And exons, yeah, and only exons code. Code for protein. So I'd have to uh, actually use the um, cDNA method would be a better way of doing that. That one. And then we, we we get into all these like applications of it. Um, so we have got gene probes. Describe a gene probe that can identify a normal CFTR protein. It's not on the syllabus. It's CFTR. It's the um, it's the protein that's normal if you don't have cystic fibrosis. So describe a gene probe. So gene probes, um, they are let's let's just say some facts about them. They are single stranded um, DNA. They have a sequence that is complementary. part of the normal CFTR gene. Um, they hybridize and can be detected as e.g. they um, carry radioactive markers. E.g. like ra radioactive phosphorus. So I'd have my genes from a patient run through electrophoresis. I'd do southern blotting to put them onto a piece of nylon. I'd add my gene probes and then those gene probes will hybridize to a complementary gene and therefore, and then I can just like, do some careful washing to remove unbound probes and avoid a false positive, and then do auto radiography where I can detect the radioactive markers, and then I get my results, which are shown here. So the diagram shows an auto radiograph. So this is the, the, this would be X-ray film from screening three people for the normal CFTR gene. DNA samples were placed at the top. So. Um, explain why person A is diagnosed as a carrier. So I've got A, B, and C. So yeah, so um, A has got yeah. There's only one, only one pro bonded. Therefore, must be heterozygous. B is normal. Two probes equals two normal, oh, one alley normal. Normal, it's because I'm putting alleles next with double L. Alleles of this gene, and C is a sufferer, a homozygous, recessive, therefore, yeah, CF sufferer. You can do that either way. You can either screen for the defective allele or you can screen for the normal allele. It depends what you're doing. Um, they're also going to ask things like, um, you know, circle the smallest fragment. Well, the smallest fragment moves the furthest. The wells are at the top. So, yeah, so that's our smallest fragment. And then DNA fingerprinting. So the diagram shows a southern blot with DNA stain for a paternity test. So this would be a nylon filter, and then some DNA has been put on it. A is the child, B is the mother, and C is the possible father. Give a conclusion for the test. Well, if the child belongs to both parents, um, all of the bands on the child need to match the parent. Remember, we measure these VNTRs, and you inherit one from one from each parent. 
let's highlight the mother ones first so yeah there's one from that two three all those match um oh, is that a match there i think it is four yeah so yeah so all all those four match let's see if any of the of the males of the father's match so that one looks like a match no, there's no match on that one let's go in between those two and no match on that one so it's only got one band that matches c well all would have to match yeah so um yeah so oops sorry um yeah so that blue one and that blue one and that blue one don't have a match with anyone c is not the the father yeah so yeah c is not the father um yeah so half of the um child's vntrs should match with the biological father yeah so as yeah, a child inherits half its dna one of each of us chromosomes its dna from each parent So the mother's the mother, but the possible father is probably disappointingly, he's not the father. Or celebratory, he's not the father. Either which way. Um, describe how the length of these DNA fragments could be be measured. This is when we, we, we we'd have a fourth well. So we'd use a yeah, so we we something called a DNA ladder. Ladder. Which is DNA of known lengths run in a parallel well in the same gel so that was DNA measuring which, which I won't get more of because it says it in the question so in effect there'd be another well at the side I'll just do it really small I'll pretend i've got this really small little one here this is our ladder and it would have known sizes of dna so and if this is this end one is 10 kilobases long or kilobase pairs then that then that'll be 20 30 40 50 if we're evenly spaced 70 80 90, 100, 110. Yeah, therefore, um, this one here is, oh yeah, it's about 94 kilobases long, according to my DNA ladder. And I've presented this one. Oh yeah, VNTR lengths are measured in this technique. What is a VNTR and why are they used in DNA fingerprinting? Well, it stands for variable number and um, repeats. So if I had some DNA, there's a gene, there's another gene, let's make this gene A and gene B. Gene, gene B is recessive in this example. A VNTR would be found here. So this is our VNTR. Um, and if I look at it, it, this might be AT, 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 AT. It's got four repeating ATs. Um, however, it, on the homologous chromosome, it could be that 20 times. So it's just a variable number of two bases, two nucleotides with 80 as its base, repeating themselves. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a variable number tandem repeats. Um, and they are highly variable between people because they have no effect on fate. Yeah? There's no like, natural selection occurring here. So into your what is DNA fingerprinting? Yeah, so the variable numbers and they they are highly variable between people. And lastly, circle the smallest DNA fragment. Well, the wells are at the top, therefore, yeah, it's that one. The according to my DNA ladder is about ten kilobase pairs long. Oh, got through it all in less than an hour.
hopefully you know that was like a run through a lot of the topic hopefully it was useful um you can see how much work is on there um but yeah um i'll stop there and get some lunch